Hi, everybody. Welcome to another tour of our solar system, a chance for us to go see some of the stuff that is happening in space around us today and see the solar system in we, which we are a part. My name is Josh. I'm part of the Morrison Planetarium team at the California Academy of Sciences, and it is my privilege to get a chance to engage with all of you today when we can't be at our museum, but in your own homes instead, and a chance for us to see our solar system in some of the same ways as we love presenting it in the Morrison Planetarium. So we're showing you our, so our, our solar system today using a software we call OpenSpace. Why do we call it OpenSpace? It's the name of the software. But it's something you can actually check out on your home computer as well. If you're feeling a little claustrophobic during our shelter in place, a really good thing to do is expand your horizons. Go check out the solar system around us and even the universe around us. Because OpenSpace can go a lot farther than we will be going today. We're keeping things a little local, hanging out in our part of the universe, our solar system. So to give us some beautiful scenery as we started off, we were looking at Jupiter and its four major moons, those orbits shown around it in blue, but we got a big solar system. There is lots of cool stuff to see. If there's something in our solar system that you want to check out, drop it in the comments. My producer Rook is hanging out and they will be happy to send it up and let me know where our next target is. But I wanted to start someplace a little closer to home and specifically home we're gonna go look at our own planet Earth. And that's not because Earth is super exciting or even boring. Earth is an awesome place. We are a varied and wonderful surface. There are cool stuff to see. But specifically, I wanted to look at the clouds that are currently over North America. Why would that be an interesting thing to see? Well, I don't know if you heard, there was supposed to be a really exciting launch today and it got scrapped. Why did it get scrapped? Because there were clouds. Now, we can actually see those very same clouds here in our software. This isn't just a simulation of clouds that happen to be in the same part. These are actual clouds from yesterday, technically, but there's a lot of the same storm system we're seeing today. Cloudy skies aren't just bad for astronomy here on the surface of Earth. They're also really detrimental for rocket launches. We want to make sure we have nice, clear, and calm skies before we send astronauts up. And it's not just the area above the launch pad. You have to make sure that you've got your entire downrange area is clear as well. Because if something did go wrong with one of these launches, we'd want to make sure we had people there in boats or planes ready to pick up our astronauts after they escaped on that escape module. Now, this was supposed to be a really important launch. The first time SpaceX was launching their Dragon capsule, sending astronauts into space. I personally am a little disappointed about the change in some of the SpaceX stuff because originally people on a Dragon capsule weren't going to be called astronauts. They were going to be called Draconauts or Dragon Riders, both of which are incredibly cool names. I would have loved to see that, but astronauts got a certain je ne sais quoi, a nice ring to it. Being called an astronaut is never a bad thing. Okay, so we are zooming back away from planet Earth. If you have a destination in our solar system, someplace you would love to see, let me know in the comments and we will happily go check it out. We're going to start off though with something that was requested from our last show and something I never got to. People wanted to know more about the rings of Saturn, not just that they were beautiful and reflective. What are they made of? Well, when we first discovered these rings, people really thought the rings of Saturn were a single solid object, like a hula hoop put around the planet. And you can really see why. From the sunward side, the inner solar system, they look solid. They even look like they might be glowing and around the same color the planet is. But that's kind of your first hint. They're not glowing. They're reflecting sunlight. Light from our sun bounces off the surface of Saturn, and it bounces off those rings. The rings aren't glowing at all. You can see the shadow they actually cast here on the surface of Saturn. That's light being blocked by the rings before it can strike the surface. And if we head around to the opposite side, it looks like a giant monster took a giant bite out of the rings. That's not actually the case. What we're seeing there is light being blocked by the planet and not hitting those rings. So they are transparent. You can see stars through them. If you look carefully right over there, that starlight is passing through the rings. This is actually one of the ways we noticed rings around some of our other major planets. Light from distant stars was blocked by the rings ever so slightly, but it was blocked as the planet passed between us and those stars. It gave us a little bit of a understanding that those planets might have rings. It's not just Saturn all of our giant planets have rings. 
So we had a question, where do shooting stars come from? That is a great one. Shooting stars are delivered to us via comets. Now, currently, I don't have any comets loaded in our software. My apologies. If you want to find out where comets are hanging out, there's lots of great resources. But I would recommend a video on our very own Facebook page you can see there, which explains some of the comet trajectories that give us our meteor showers. But when a meteor shower occurs, basically, it's when the orbit of Earth as we travel around the sun, pardon me, there we go. Imagine if a comet swept through this part of our solar system right next to Earth. We're the third planet last time I checked. So a comet swoops past, but Earth isn't there. We don't have a near miss or anything. But then later, Earth wanders back through that same part of our solar system. All the little bits of dust and debris that fell off that comet would get pulled in to Earth's gravitational influence. And basically, as they got pulled in, anything that struck Earth's atmosphere would do one of three things. Either bounce off, that does happen. It would fall in and start to ablate, which means it heats up a lot. Little particles of it fly off. And as it burns up in the atmosphere, we get to see a beautiful streak of light. That's our meteor. Or it hits the surface, in which case it stops being a meteor and starts being a meteorite, the stone of a meteor, the thing that actually strikes the surface of Earth. So even though our comets go very, very far from us, they have a very local source. When we see a meteor shower, it's our own air being excited caused to glow. So someone asked for one of our ice giants. Alas, I still haven't gotten our ice giants working on my computer. I think we might have to wait until we're back in the academy for me to get a better desktop for us to see some really cool stuff. But if you do want to see our great red spot on Jupiter, we happen to notice that we were in a prime position for seeing it. It was facing straight towards the sun, and that means we have a great view of Jupiter's great red spot. It's kind of redundant to say great view of great red spot, I guess, but I hope you can hold with the spirit. Now, this is sort of an exciting thing. Jupiter spins fast, so it's not always facing the right direction. If Jupiter's spun around, the great red spot can be facing away, and we just don't get to see it. And since it spins around once every 11 hours, that's one day on Jupiter is 11 hours, it's moving pretty quick. One really cool thing about our open space software is that a lot of the objects have their correct rotation. So Earth spins once every 24 hours. You have Mercury spinning a lot slower than that. Jupiter spins very quickly, partially, I think, because it's such a massive planet. Now, you can see the great red spot right here. I got distracted talking about spinning stuff. It's really fun. But this great red spot is great. Now, it's less great than it used to be. Once upon a time, we said the great red spot was three Earths wide. One, two, three. That's no longer the case. We learned that in elementary school. And by the time I got into high school, we looked at it and we learned it was two Earths wide. One, two. And again, that's not the case. Turns out the great red spot has been shrinking. Even in as recently as 10 to 15 years, it has reduced dramatically in size down to the spot we see today. These are fairly recent Hubble photos, and these Hubble photos are showing us that the Great Red Spot is about an Earth and a half wide. So if you wanted to see how big Earth would be in this picture, take from this side of the Great Red Spot all the way past the eye of the storm, and that's about one Earth. Now, you can fit about a half an Earth over here, but that's a pretty small Great Red Spot. We've been petitioning to have NASA change the name, or the IAU, I guess, to the just okay red spot, but so far no one has emailed us back. Now, one really cool thing just above the great red spot, I should say just below, I think this is southward, but can you see a different feature on Jupiter? We call this Jupy McJove face, and man, that is a funny looking feature on Jupiter. It won the hearts and minds of the internet instantaneously upon its discovery. Juno has seen a lot of strange stuff in the clouds of Jupiter and is guaranteed to see a whole bunch more. A huge planet like Jupiter can tell us an awful lot about gas giants, which seem to be a common kind of planet in our universe. We're excited also to learn about our ice giants, because ice giants are seemingly one of the most common kinds of planets in our galaxy. Ooh, we got a request for the inner solar system from my friend Andrew. That sounds like a cool thing to do. We don't get to spend much time in the inner solar system. People, I think, learned about Venus and Mercury in elementary school and never bothered to turn their interest back there. And to me, that is a shame. These are fascinating planets to be sure. So moving in, we can see not the surface of Venus, but actually it's cloud layer hanging out above. 
because the surface of Venus is hidden from view. If you want to see Venus right when the sun goes down, I've missed it the past few nights. I think you got to head out right when the sun goes down. You should see a very bright object. It's getting fainter, but if you see Venus, you're seeing light bouncing off those clouds to reach us here on Earth. Now, when you look at those clouds, they are very different than the clouds we have on our planet. They just look different. Part of that is the atmosphere itself. Carbon dioxide makes it a very opaque kind of thing. We're also seeing an interesting color of light pass through, probably much more yellowy orangey. Now, if we wanted to see underneath those clouds, we can actually use a radar map right here by kind of imagining that atmosphere was transparent, like our own atmosphere to our eyes. Now, radar waves passing through that atmosphere give us some information. Basically, it tells us how bumpy something is or how smooth something is. Now, the bumpy stuff colors in dark. The smooth stuff colors in lighter. When you start looking around, there are some very smooth spots and some very bumpy spots. There is one other feature I would love to call out, specifically impacts. When we look at a bumpy planet, we tend to see a lot of craters on it. How many craters do you see on Venus? I really don't see many at all. Again, if you folks have questions, drop them in there. I see a whole bunch of great comments coming in. I would do my best to get to all of these. The craters tell us how old something is. The more craters you see, the older a surface is. You could take this away as saying parts of Venus are very, very young, but probably more truthfully, what we're seeing is a little bit of volcanic activity, a little bit of renewing of the surface, but potentially also Venus's atmosphere acts like Earth's atmosphere and protects it a little bit from those objects coming in. So between a combination of volcanism and a combination of a thick protective atmosphere, we just don't see much effects on Venus. But zooming back, uh, we also want to check out Mercury. And Mercury is a great case study because Mercury has a whole bunch of craters on it. When we compare it to Venus, you can immediately see this is a much more ancient surface in astronomical terms. Most of Mercury, I would bet, dates back to the beginning of our solar system. It might be one of the older surfaces out there. We just don't see a lot of volcanic activity there, not a lot of smoothing out, and we see the surface absolutely covered in craters. But craters tell us lots of interesting stories. Here's one to check out. Now, when you start looking at craters for long enough, you can start to tell how big they are and how old they are just by looking at a crater. That might seem to be pretty strange, but let's take a couple case studies right here. If I just show you this crater, I can tell you it's a very small crater, even without context. Now, obviously, this is a smaller crater than this one or this one, but the shape tells you that too. A crater with a bump in the middle is larger than a small crater. A crater with a wall in the middle, like this guy right here, is even bigger. And for some of the biggest craters around, we see a double or triple wall structure. That means it is absolutely huge. If you want to find out more about craters and the stories they tell, tune in Friday for our Cosmic Conversation. We're going to have a moon expert, Dr. Day, telling us all about the craters we see on the moon. Now, we can also learn about their age, and here's a super cool way to do it. Check out these two craters. I see one crater, two craters. Can you pick them out? So we'll call this one Crater A, this one Crater B. Which one is older, Crater A or Crater B? It pretty much has to be Crater A because Crater A is underneath Crater B. So Crater A was there first when Crater B fell. And using that kind of idea, we can start to piece together the respective ages of features on the moon. And this gives us a huge uh, set of information about the time dimension, how old things are on the surface of Mercury and pretty much any rocky planet. I saw someone asked for Neptune. I know I'm cutting ahead of Rook. There we go. But I would love to go show us Neptune because... Neptune is in so many ways one of our problem children of the solar system. It's far from the sun, and it doesn't play by our rules. Now, Uranus also kind of has the same deal going on. It has to rotate the wrong direction. I should say different direction. There is no wrong in space. But Neptune, if I wanted to know how old a surface feature is on Neptune, I just count the craters, right? Big problem. No craters. This is a smushy, icy surface with a thick atmosphere wrapped around it. This isn't a gas giant like Jupiter that's pretty much just clouds on the outside. An ice giant has a fundamentally different structure. Imagine landing on a convenience store Slurpee or Squishy 
you have an icy matrix with a dense fluid suspended within, this would be almost impossible for us to interact with in the same way we interact with our nice solid surface of Earth. It would not be a place hospitable to anything like the life we know here. Now, some people imagine there could be life that would form on an ice giant. I think it would have to be really tough. This is an extreme environment by any metric, and there's a lot more comfortable spots in our solar system. If you were picking a place to have life, I would look towards those ice moons, places like Earth, maybe even Mars. But there are cool features here on Neptune. You can see that dark spot surrounded in white clouds. That's not artificial color. These are actual images, and they give us a great understanding of the outer surface. But for the inner surface, or more in-depth knowledge, we just don't have it. Neptune and Uranus are some of the worst studied planets in our solar system because we've never sent an orbiter there, or a lander either. They've only ever had one real flyby mission. That was our Voyagers back in, I think, the 70s when they launched, and they didn't get to Neptune until, I think, around the 90s. Oh, can we see Pluto? Of course we can see Pluto. Pluto is a super cool planet, but because I forgot to check the box, Pluto's not showing up. Hold on one second. We are going to turn Pluto on. There we go. And head out. Now, hopefully Pluto shows up. Oh, I didn't turn on the orbit line for it because I turned on planet orbit lines and Pluto's not a planet. Now, that's not just according to the International Astronomer Union. It's also according to our software, but that shouldn't affect your conditional love of Pluto. Pluto is an amazing world to be sure. When you look at Pluto, we can put into action what we thought about at the surface of Mercury and Venus. Let's talk about bumps. Let's talk about craters. Looking around here, you can see a fair amount of craters, a fair amount of bumps. This looks like an ancient surface, right? And that fits our narrative of Pluto. Pluto should be an ancient frozen ball of ice that's absolutely boring to study, right? Well, we got some cool cracks and other stuff running around. We've got some icy mountains that look like they're being shaped by the sun right down here. Check out that awesome texture. But I also have an incredibly active world on Pluto, and it's so close. You could almost reach out and touch it. Check out this weird, smooth white spot. Now, what's going on here? Well, we can't really see because of Pluto's nighttime. But using planetarium magic, we can get rid of our nighttime and see the surface of Pluto completely illuminated. Now, these are photos taken from New Horizons as it flew past. We actually know the surface of Pluto much better than we know the surface of Uranus or Neptune because of that mission. Now, looking around here, you can spot some very strange texture. That's what I love about some of these space photos. It's almost like you could touch them. You can imagine what the surface would be like. This smooth stuff, you can see bubbling and changing, kind of like the top of a pot of boiling water, or maybe boiling something more viscous, like pudding. If you were cooking your pudding on your stove, like people did in the days of yore, you would see that kind of bubbling, changing outer surface. This, we think, is an ocean of toothpaste consistency nitrogen. Now, here on Earth, we are breathing nitrogen. It's a gas. On the surface of Pluto, it is so chilly, the nitrogen has puddled on the surface, making this giant, smushy glacier. Now, if that's not awesome, I don't know what is. We had a question from Caleb, Ava, and Brian. They would like to see the sun. Okay, so we are heading in from one of the chillier parts of our solar system to one of the toastier, and we are actually traveling four-ish light hours. Now, that means light from the sun is about four hours old by the time it gets to Pluto. We just took a four light hour trip in seconds. That's the power of planetarium software. And remember, you can do a tour just like this in your own house for yourself. If you download the open space software and do some exploring, you can find it at openspaceproject.com. Now, when we look at the surface of the sun, you'll notice no craters. Well, that's true. The surface of the sun is not solid rock. It's very active. It is pretty much just hydrogen in the form of plasma. Now, if something smashes into the sun, generally it burns up before there's much of an impact. So no craters for a number of reasons. But when you look down at that surface, you can actually see a change in color. Now, that's not necessarily a texture change like we were talking about before, but it is a temperature change. Some parts of the sun are hotter than others. The hottest parts are glowing that bright, bright whitish color. The cooler parts are darker. They're still hot, 
the hottest parts are the surface, not the outer part, but the surface we're seeing would be around 6,000 Kelvin. The cooler parts, the sun spot specifically, would be around 4,000 Kelvin. Not a lot cooler. Smash mouth lied. You can't go walking on the sun, but it is still a lot cooler than the area around it. There are some stars out there that only ever reach the same temperature as our sunspots. That means they're a lot toastier, or excuse me, a lot less toasty than our star. Okay, heading away from our sun, we have to get pretty far before that glow dies down. We've actually artificially dimmed the sun a huge amount so that we could see the stuff around it. When you look at those distant stars, remember they are like our sun. Some are brighter, some are fainter, but they are so far away that we only see a pinprick of light instead of that gigantic glow. Oh, somebody wants to go check out Mars. I think that is a great idea. We have some really cool stuff on the surface of Mars to check out. Okay, so heading in, this is the fourth planet from the sun. And as we head in, the first thing you might notice around Mars is the color. Turns out Mars does have that kind of reddish hue. Ooh, we came in from a perfect angle. I wish I had to take credit for planning this, but I cannot. You see something kind of weird, shiny and glowing on Mars right here? Well, this is the atmosphere of Mars. The air wrapped around it, you can see the red-brown surface below. But when we look into that atmosphere, there's actually like a thick part of the atmosphere right here. That shiny, glowy bit is a low spot on the surface. Turns out this low spot is a feature we call Vallis Marineris, Mariner Valley. Now, I want to take you in, and as we do, check this place out. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, you should let us know in comments. I always think it's interesting to find out how many people have actually been there. But the Grand Canyon is our biggest canyon here on Earth. When you look at Vallis Marineris on Mars, this is a huge feature. Right around here, you might notice there's some side fissures, some little cracks running parallel to the main crack. Those are huge. One of them, like this guy right here, might be around the same length as our Grand Canyon. We think of our Grand Canyon as being big because it's a couple, I think, a couple hundred miles long. This thing is about 2,500 miles long. This is the biggest canyon human beings have ever seen, for sure the biggest one in our solar system. Uh, looking around here, you can see another one of Mars's mega rocks right up here. This guy is Olympus Mons. Now, there are many big volcanoes on Mars. You can see three others right next to it. One, two, three. But these guys would be famous in the solar system if it weren't for Olympus Mons taking all the credit. It is the biggest volcano human beings have ever seen. So some folks are asking about this software. This is something you can download at home, and it is 100% capable of showing you stars, galaxies, galaxy clusters. NASA helped contribute to it. The American Museum of Natural History is really shaping its growth. Here at the California Academy of Sciences, we are proud to be one of the contributing partners. But this is some really awesome software. Many collaborators working together, and I'm delighted to say it's something you can check out at home. Okay, so let's see. Any other questions popping up? Ooh, Uranus. That's true. We gave credit to Neptune for being one of the forgotten awesome things of the solar system. Let's go check out Uranus, too. So Uranus is sometimes called Uranus by people who like silly jokes. I'm definitely one of them. But when we talk about pronunciations, Uranus would probably be the most correct, and that's super hard to say. When you look at Uranus, you can see some change in color. Very much a different blue than Neptune. Neptune has that deep, rich, purpley, dark blue. This is more of a robin's egg blue. And down here, this yellow color isn't like glare from the sun or anything. That's actually a change in the atmosphere chemical content and therefore a change in the color. But when you look around all of this blue color, you can see some dark clouds, some light clouds. There's a lot of variation. But one super interesting thing about Uranus, this is another rule breaker. I mentioned before it's funny tilt. It's true. A lot of the planets travel through our solar system spinning like this. That's pretty much how Earth spins, even though we have a little bit of a tilt. Neptune spins like this. Uranus spins like this. Its pole is tilted almost directly towards the sun. And I can actually show you that if I bring back our trails. Check it out. Isn't this weird? You'd assume based on how it's moving, that the North Pole would be right up here. It's not. 
the North Pole is over here. So it doesn't so much spin through the solar system as roll through the solar system. We've seen planets forming around other stars. And by and large, our understanding based on systems like TRAPPIST is that they should form spinning the same direction as they rotate around their plane of their solar system. That's not the case here. Some people think it's from a collision that hit Uranus a long time ago, but we also see the same thing on Pluto. I would say right now it's not super well understood why some of our planets have this different orientation. But when you look at the plane of our solar system, they all hang out pretty close to it. You could imagine if you took our map of the solar system and set it on a dinner plate, most of the planet's orbit lines would stay pretty close to the surface of that plate. Pluto goes a little bit high above and a little far below, but Pluto's weird for a lot of reasons. We think this plane exists because of how our solar system formed. As planets were coming and being around our sun, they all orbited in a disk of material getting bigger and bigger. Jupiter formed first, became the largest. The rest of our planets formed, and there were little bits of leftovers, our comets and asteroids. Now, some folks were asking about our asteroid belt. That hangs out in this empty region between Mars and Jupiter. Turns out it's not actually empty. There are little bits of rock but those little bits of rock are super teeny tiny and they are so small, we can't actually see them. Sorry, Brooke, I saw you just put up a comment, but I got so into gesturing, I totally missed it. Asteroid belt. Well, again, I can't show you our entire asteroid belt, but I can show you one super cool, mega awesome asteroid within it. That is the dwarf planet Ceres. Now, if I were to tell you about a dwarf planet that used to be a planet, most people assume I'm talking about Pluto. That's not the case. Ceres also used to be a dwarf planet, and it became not a dwarf planet. Or excuse me, used to be a whole planet and became a dwarf planet not too long ago. In between, it was just an asteroid. But Ceres is an interesting object to be sure. And again, we can see an absolute ton of craters on the surface telling us of an ancient place. Now, we can go back and do our kind of quiz section Again, look at these craters and see if you can understand how big they might be based on their shape. When you see a big one like this with that bump in the middle, you know those are large. When you see one without a bump, you know it has to be pretty small. And when you see one that forms a ring structure in the middle, you know we are looking at a real big crater. Now, if you can spot one of those, let me know. But I see one right up here with that double wall. I think I saw one over here too. But looking at craters has become my new pastime. We've all developed weird hobbies under shelter in place. Mine's looking at craters in planetarium software. Talia wants to check out our moon, and I think that is a great place to go. So if you are a lunatic like I am and you like craters, you like the moon, again, make sure you tune in Friday for our cosmic conversations. It is a really cool chance for us to talk to a Died in the wool expert, one of the people who studies our moon surface in incredible detail, and he's helping us pick out some of the coolest spots around. So I don't want to step on his toes too much for his broadcast. So uh, just checking out a cool couple things on the surface of the moon. This is one of our seas of the moon. And right down here, you can see a flat, smooth plane. These dark regions on the moon we call mare, or the oceans of the moon. And right down here, these dark features are where lava flowed into craters a long time ago and sort of filled them up. Now, we can see some evidence of this on the mountains that are sticking out of the bed of this crater. Check out right here. That's the tippy top of a whole bunch of mountains. As lava flowed up the side, the area around them kind of disappeared, and only the peaks are still sticking out. So... Tim mentioned, yeah, I do want to say 11.30, not 4.30. Don't tune in at 4.30, although it should be recorded and online. So if you miss our, any of our broadcasts, including this one, all of our shows should be available via Facebook Live and on YouTube, or YouTube for our open space ones. Okay, so saving some cool content for Dr. Day on Friday, we also have our Thursday broadcast, which is going to be a Q&A with our assistant director, Bing Kwok. And you can tune in Tuesdays for our early learners broadcast on Tuesday morning at 9.30 for Mary Holt. She'll be talking about moon explorers. So if you have little kids who want to learn more about the moon surface, make sure you tune in on Tuesdays at 9.30. 
Okay, so heading back from our moon, I want to take us back into arguably my favorite planet in the solar system. It doesn't have cool craters to see from above, at least not big obvious ones like these other places. But if you know where to look, there are a few. This, again, has been the Open Space software. You can check it out on the openspaceproject.com. You can fly out and see all the cool places I have shown you here today and some other really cool spots on the planet we have mapped best in our solar system for sure. This is our very own planet Earth. So since we can't visit our museum in person, I've taken to visiting it via our software as frequently as I can. I really miss our museum, and I hope all of you get a chance to join us there again soon, as soon as our shelter-in-place orders have been lifted and we are allowed to return and gather together. So as we drop down in, I would like to thank all of you for joining me here for our tour of the solar system. Check out openspaceproject.com and have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay happy, stay healthy. We miss you all. Take care.